Okay, folks, um, today we're going to be trying something a little different here on the Sit Rep Podcast. This is something I said I would never do, and to be frank, today's content is a little bit of a test balloon, but for now, I'm going to yield to the baying of the masses and try my hand at a historical movie review. Now, I know, the last thing the internet needs is one more jackass who (laughs) um, assumes that he's qualified to talk about movies. Much less a historical movie, much less a military historical movie. But we've had a lot of requests for this, so consider today a reconnaissance in force. Okay, so a couple of things. Number one, I'm not going to be reviewing the movie's script or direction, acting, cinematography, production design. I didn't go to film school. I don't pretend to be knowledgeable about that kind of thing. I'm only going to be focusing on the movie's military historical accuracy, especially as it pertains to our hobby in wargaming. It pains me to say it, but when new players are just getting into historical or they're trying out a new uh, era or a new army, sometimes the first place they go is a movie. So the least I can do is try to steer you towards some of the better movies out there and away from some of the stinkers. Um, Second, at least for the start, we're going to be focusing more on positive movie reviews. So, I mean, we all know there's a lot of garbage out there. I mean, there is some trash uh, floating around out there when it comes to uh, military historical accuracy. Um, So we're going to stick to some of the good ones, at least at first, to see if this new series even gets going. Um, Because nobody wants to log on just to hear me, you know, weep and rage for 20 minutes. So, with all that out of the way, uh, let's go ahead and get to our first relatively good military historical movie. So, the movie that we're going to be taking a look at today is MGM's 1969 classic, The Battle of Britain. So, right off the bat, you can tell why I said in my intro that I wasn't going to be critiquing any of the acting in this movie. We got Kurt Jurgens, Ian McShane, Michael Caine, Christopher Plummer, Sir Lawrence Olivier, Robert Shaw. There's no way I'm going to be critiquing any of these guys acting, so come on. This movie also had Major General Adolf Gallant. He was a famous German Luftwaffe fighter ace during World War II as one of its many technical advisors. So this movie's pretty solid on a historical aspect. Nevertheless, there are going to be a few things I want to point out, so let's go ahead and get started. So the movie starts off with a British Hurricane fighter executing a perhaps undeserved victory roll over a column of fleeing British tanks and French civilians. So right off the bat, we set the tone and the time. This is the summer of 1940, Germany has invaded Western Europe, and France is in the process of collapse. So as this fighter pilot lands at his home airfield, we come to the first big thing I really like about this movie's historical aspect. They do a great job at showcasing the Hawker Hurricane. I know the Spitfire is the famous fighter type of the Battle of Britain, but really it's the Hawker Hurricane that fights most of the battles. In the Battle of France, I think it's one fighter in nine in Fighter Command were actually Spitfires, and even during the Battle of Britain, it was still only one fighter in three. So the workhorse of RAF Fighter Command is still the Hawker Hurricane. Now these British pilots have to evacuate in the face of what is supposedly nearby German breakthroughs. They drop some names of where the Germans are breaking through and where they're advancing. The British weren't really deployed in those exact areas or really anywhere close. It's a tiny detail, that's that's not a big thing. But as they're getting ready to evacuate, they come under a strafing attack by these German fighters. These are Messerschmitt BF-109s. Now I really only have two minor problems with this scene. Number one, you can't really see it in this screenshot, but some of the Germans are coming in at fence top level. I'm not kidding about that. They come in at insanely low altitude. You could reach up your hand and slap the plane as it flies over your head. It's a great cinematic effect and it's very dramatic. I don't know what you're going to hit in a strafing attack when you're already that low. Also the sound effect. They use the same machine gun sound effect for the German fighters as they're going to use for the British fighters through the rest of the movie. My only issue with that is German fighters, they had machine guns and cannon, 20mm automatic cannon. So when German fighters fire their weapons, they're going to sound very, very different than how they sound uh, here in the movie. So as the British are being thrown out of Europe and they've pretty much lost their part of the Battle of France, we meet this character here. This is Air Chief Marshal Lord Hugh Dowding, played by Laurence Olivier. And here the movie really nails a couple of things. Number one, Lawrence Olivier really looks like Doubting quite a bit, uh, believe it or not, here in this scene. And number two, there's a voiceover in this scene that I believe Olivier is reading straight from Doubting's original memorandum to Churchill. I believe he's reading the actual document. 
where he is recommending in no uncertain terms that the Battle of France is lost. It's still ongoing, but it's basically lost. And the best thing that we can do for our national interest is to kind of abandon the French, sorry, and pull all of our fighters out of France, back to England, ready for that inevitable Battle of Britain that is going to immediately follow after the conclusion of the Battle of France. Hard cut to Germans rolling up the rest of northern France, and you can just go ahead and ignore this thing. That There hardly is a single thing correct about I don't know what that vehicle is even supposed to represent. Just go ahead and ignore that. What they do a much better job with is this scene, which is part of the credit sequence of the movie, that depicts uh, German officers inspecting squadrons of Heinkel HE 111 bombers. Now, I believe that when they made this movie, they used the Spanish Air Force, which still had fleets of these HE 111s hanging around. So that's great. They have the real bombers that were used in the Battle of Britain in the movie. Now, again, these are 1960s Spanish HE-111s. So if you're a scale modeler at larger scales, there might be slight differences. But for any kind of a war game, these are almost perfect aircraft. My only problem here is a bit of a sin of omission. This movie is going to show us endless fleets of HE-111s, which is great. The only problem is the Luftwaffe was also using large numbers of JU-88As and Dornier DO-17 bombers as well. So you're going to see tons of HE-111s, swell, but if you're a war gamer and you're into the Battle of Britain, your German bomber fleets, you do have a lot of other options. Here, unfortunately, we come to my biggest single problem with the movie historically. It shows the Battle of France ending at Dunkirk, which it absolutely did not. It went on for at least another three or four weeks. Some of the hardest battles were fought after Dunkirk. And it shows uh, during this pause, the Germans trying to make peace. We have Kurt Jurgens here, the immortal Kurt Jurgens, playing a German ambassador. And uh, it kind of skips over the whole first third of the Battle of Britain. So the Battle of France doesn't really end until at least June 18th, and then there's occupation problems and everything else. So the Germans aren't really done wrapping up France until probably the end of June. And the Battle of Britain really begins in what the Germans called the Kanalkampf, or the Battle Over the Canal. And that takes place, uh, that starts in like early July. So this idea that there was this long pause while the Germans were just kind of sitting around wondering what to do didn't really happen. Here we see the Germans starting to make preparations for the invasion of Britain. Uh, a bit of an impressive display. I don't know if Operation Sea Line ever got this far along. But they're making a point in the movie that Britain is under a real threat. They have almost nothing left in the way of ground defense. And if, God forbid, their air force fails against the imminent German air force attack, the road is going to be wide open for a German invasion of Lower England. So here we come to the British Air Force pilots, and it looks like they're rather relaxed, despite the amount of danger they're in. This is actually kind of accurate, though. So what British fighter pilots would do, especially the ones that were on alert, is they would literally sit around outside their ready room, right next to their fighters, and as soon as they got the call that fighters were coming in, they, would, they were right next to their fighters here. But until then, they really had nothing to do. Training, replacement, maintenance, that was all, that was all being done by other squadrons. And then as pilots and aircraft were ready, they were fed into these alert squadrons. So it looks a little relaxed here, but trust me, these guys have a lot on their mind right now. This is also where we get our first really good look at a Spitfire. And again, the movie's got plenty of Spitfires in it, and it does a great job of showcasing just how awesome these planes were. Note the very classic, a very distinctive elliptical wing. If you're looking at the plane from the side and you can't really see the shape of the wing, the great way to tell the difference between a Hurricane and a Spitfire is where the cockpit is. In the Spitfire, the cockpit is swept way back down the fuselage, practically behind the wing. On the Hurricane, it's much further forward. So as both sides really start to gear up for the battle, we start seeing some of the planning that's involved. And what this staff officer is showing us here is a great map that really explains the battle at a glance is the organization of Royal Air Force Fighter Command. We see that 10, 11, and 12 there. There's a 13 you can't quite see up on top. It's cut off on the, from the frame a little bit there. These are the fighter groups that the Royal Air Force Fighter Command is organized into. Obviously, 11 group, because the word's located, is going to take the brunt of the fighting. That's well over half of the active fighter strength is right there in 11 group. And what 10, 11, and 13 groups are doing is not only defending their parts of England, but they're under much less pressure. Is they're the ones training pilots, repairing aircraft, feeding these fresh replacements into 11 Group, 
And then as squadrons and planes and pilots get burnt out, shot up, exhausted, in 11 group they're rotated out and they go into 10, 11, or 13 group, and then they're replaced by fresh pilots. So the British have this little bit of a conveyor belt, uh, so that 11 group is always at the best they can as far as full strength and fully rested pilots and well-maintained aircraft. The system is going to break down a little bit during the battle, but for the start, it does pretty well. This scene also does a great job of showing how the British air warning system works. Everybody had radar in 1940. It was relatively new, but everybody kind of had it. But what the British really nailed here, and what this scene definitely nails from a historical standpoint, they actually have like a chalkboard where the guy shows you all the levels and explains how it works. How an integrated air defense system really works. Everybody has one now, but the British were the first ones to really take radar and really leverage it in the way that pretty much air forces do taken for granted nowadays. Another great thing that the movie does is that it takes time to introduce you to the German pilots as well as the British pilots. Of course the British pilots are the main characters, but they also introduce you to German pilots, they show them as actual people, they have names, they have, I think one of them has a younger brother in the squadron, their squadron has a little butler, I mean it really goes into uh, at least a little bit of depth about how the German Air Force operates and you know showing them as yeah, they're the enemy, but they're also, you know, human beings. They're not just planes that get blown up in special effects shots. Now, again, here we come to what this movie would have you believe is the beginning of the Battle of Britain. This is Adler Tag, or German for Eagle Day. It's absolutely not the beginning of the Battle of Britain, but it's where the Battle of Britain shifted from the canal over actual landmass of Lower England. So that's where you actually start to see what we kind of consider classic Battle of Britain. So this movie sort of generalizes that a little bit. Eh, it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a gripe, but no big deal. Here's another briefing scene, and I wanted to bring this one up because of that chalkboard there at lower right. Again, uh, Major General Gallant was a uh, technical advisor for this movie, so the details here are pretty spot on. Notice those four little crosses there in the corner of that chalkboard, the lower corner. Those are German fighters. So clearly German fighters would operate in pairs, and then those pairs would pair up into what the Germans would call a Schwarm. So it's a group of four fighters organized into two pairs. And just like a fighter leader and his wingman can cover each other, those two pair could cover each other. It was a great system. The Germans came up with it in World War I. They cont everyone continues it now. It's pretty much the standard through air forces, you know, pretty much around the world. By contrast, at the upper left of that uh, same chalkboard, we see the British in two groups of three. This is how the British ran their fighters in the early part of World War II. It was absolutely awful. It was tragically out of date. It didn't work at all. Nevertheless, the movie does take an honest look at it. And not only here on this chalkboard, but throughout the movie, we'll see the British operating in groups of three. There will be a section leader, and then what they call his number two and his number three. This does not work at all for a whole bunch of reasons we'll get into later in the movie. But they do pay attention to, even in the tiny little chalkboard, you do see little historically accurate details. So here the Germans are taking off in their Messerschmitt BF-109s. Those are Messerschmitt BF-109s. Uh, they're not really the BF-109Es that were prevalent in the Battle of Britain. You can tell by the intake that's underneath the, uh, the propeller there, and the shape of the fuselage under the aircraft's chin and then down over its belly. It's much more rounded than the BF-109Es that you would really see in the Battle of Britain. So if your models don't look exactly like this, that's kind of the reason why. The markings are just about perfect though, just they don't have the exact variant of BF-109 here. But again, no big deal. So some of the very first big German airstrikes that came in on Adler Tag were flown by these guys. These are of course the uh, Junkers Ju-87 Stuka dive bomber. They were tasked with knocking out those uh, radar towers that were along the southern coast of England. That was the first line of detection and defense for the uh, Royal Air Force Fighter Command. They didn't do so well. They did knock out plenty of those, uh, those radar towers. The problem is they, for a number of reasons I won't get into, they weren't really well escorted by fighters. And once a Stuka enters enemy airspace without fighter protection, it's a, it's a flying turkey. It's pretty much dead. But the movie does show that and it does take a really good look at just how vulnerable Stukas are. Nevertheless, they did knock out plenty of those radar towers. And that's when we come to the Observer Corps. 
This is the backup for when the radar system either can't cover everything because the British didn't have a limited amount of radar, or when they uh, they started taking damage to their radar network. Again, the Germans were bombing it pretty heavily. So you see the OC on this gentleman's helmet. That's the Observer Corps. He's got his uh, his observation equipment there, and his buddy there is on the phone. He's calling the same people that those radar operators are calling. Uh, RAF Fighter Command. Here are the German fighters. This is the post number. Of course, the post number is plotted on the map. X amount of German fighters, X amount of type, at this vector, on this heading, at this altitude, and so on. So whenever the radar started to get gaps, which definitely happened, these guys would take over. What the Germans were really going for in the early part of the Battle of Britain were these uh, runways, these airfields, the RAF Fighter Command's runways. So they knew, obviously, that the best way to knock out an enemy's fighter force isn't the hard way, shooting down fighters in the sky one by one, but rather knock out their airfields. This is going to do three things. Number one, you're going to destroy some of them on the ground. And we actually do see that in the movie. We do see some fighters trying to take off while being bombed. And no, not all of them make it. You destroy the enemy fighter command's infrastructure. Their fuel, their hangars, their repair shops, all that stuff. And number three, you're forcing enemy fighters to fight in areas that you can predict. Because after all, you're the one that's attacking the airfields. So here we have another great shot of HE-111s. Again, just please remember, there were also JU-88s and Doherty A-17s. I guess they just didn't have any for the movie, but again, if you're wargaming the Battle of Britain, you do have options besides the HE-111. One of the scenes I really like is this one here, where they take a moment to showcase the British ground crews. So, I think the statistic is, depending on the Air Force, for every fighter pilot that's actually in the sky, there's anywhere between 7 and 20 people on the ground keeping him there. And that's just within the squadron itself. Never mind, you know, group, flight, wing, the higher, you know, echelon levels, you know, further up. These guys were working insane, you know, 20, 30, 48 hours straight, non-stop, no break uh, shifts, keeping these planes in the air while being bombed pretty ferociously by the, by the Germans. So the, the idea that the Royal Air Force Fighter Command could remain standing under this kind of pressure really is quite remarkable. And it's largely down to guys like this. And this is the damage that we see. This is where, you know, notice the destroyed fighters, the pockmarked airfields. You can't operate an Air Force off of facilities like this. This is what the Germans were really trying to do. And things were starting to get pretty bad. And these kind of cracks in the RAF Fighter Command were spreading all the way to the highest echelons. These two officers here, we have Commander of 12 Group over on the left, that's uh, Lee Mallory, and uh, Park, he commands 11 Group over there on the right. Now Park is the one under immediate pressure, he's 11 Group Commander, he's on the front line. Sometimes his fighter squadrons get less than two minutes warning before they're engaged. They have to launch, climb to altitude, and engage German bombers that are trying to take out their own airfields underneath them. So his tactic is what's called the Little Wing. He has to engage German planes with whatever fighters he has, like literally with minutes notice. Sometimes he's attacking German bomber formations with as few as six planes. Uh, his counterpart over there, Lee Mallory, he's got a little bit more time, obviously up there in the Midlands. He says, I'm going to go ahead and wait till I get 50 or 60 or even 100 fighters together and I'm going to smack the Germans all at once. That makes a lot of sense on paper. The problem is he can't always get those planes together in that much time. And by the time he can get in there and actually help anybody, especially Park, who's being absolutely massacred in the south, the Germans have hit their targets and are on their way home. So the basic question comes down to, do you hit the Germans with a few planes now or with a lot of planes later? This is the little wing versus big wing debate. And uh, this might make a pretty big difference in some of your scenario builds and scenario designs for your war games. The problem is... These two guys really went at it. They really went for each other's throats. And it was showing that even at the highest echelons, the stress was really starting to mount. And the Royal Air Force was starting to show signs of, I don't want to say collapse, but they were really starting to get stressed out. What really kind of turns the tide is when a flight of HE-111 bombers kind of gets lost somewhere over in England. You can see the sun's going down. They're out of time. They're bingo fuel. They have to turn around and head home. They can't find their targets. So the standard procedure in this case is to jettison your bombs and head home. The problem is they happen to be over London at the time, and so they accidentally bomb London. Now, that's really a bad thing because Winston Churchill, of course, retaliates, and the very next night he bombs Berlin on purpose. 
This gets under Hitler's skin to no, uh, <laughs> no small degree. And he says, oh, fine, you want to play it like that? We're going to go ahead and play it like that. And that's where we see huge fleets of German bombers start going after British cities. And of course, this is kind of the beginning of the Blitz, where the British population centers start to get hit, especially London, but also all kinds of other cities. And it really is a bad, bad time for the British uh, civilians. The uh, good news is the Germans start taking tremendous losses in doing this for a number of factors. Number one, they now have to travel a lot further north to hit these British cities, especially London. This means that more and more of their bomber formations come within range of 12 group and those big wings we were talking about. So here's where we start to see British fighter formations really start to grow in size. So we see a much larger group of hurricanes in this slide here, for example. So the fight, the, the, the dog fights become much bigger. The Germans uh, start to suffer much more heavy losses because they're up against uh, much larger formations of British fighters. The airfields in 11 group start to recover because they're no longer being bombed every day. The German bombers are bombing British cities now instead of the airfields. And uh, German fighters, especially, don't have enough fuel to escort the bombers properly that far north. The bombers have plenty of fuel, the, the fighters don't. So things really start to turn. It's a it's, it's terrible, terrible experience for the British civilians, obviously. The firefighters and the emergency medical team, the cities really do suffer tremendously. But in a cold, calculating kind of way, it really kind of is what saves the Royal Air Force. Speaking of which, this is where the battle is really run. This is uh, RAF Fighter Command, where all those Observer Corps and radar reports eventually come to. And once all those developments are plotted in real time by the staff, notice these are almost all women. And the movie isn't trying to be woke or anything like that. This is 1969. They're being historically accurate. A tremendous, tremendous load of the telecommunications work, the radar detectors, the communications, the air co coordination, the message traffic, all that stuff was handled almost entirely by women. That's just the way it was. Now, another thing that starts to come into the battle is Allied squadrons start to enter the battle. Uh, at first, almost by accident. So here we see a free Polish uh, hurricane engaging some German fighters. Which leads to my favorite scene of the movie. Um, I don't know how historically accurate it is, but I always get a laugh every time I see it. This poor Polish hurricane pilot gets shot down. He bails out successfully. He parachutes into this field where a bunch of home guard guys with pitchforks run out after him. And he says in his very broken English with a heavy, you know, Eastern European accent, you know, good afternoon. They naturally assume he's a German and uh, he is uh, led off to a prisoner of war camp at Pitchfork Point there. So hopefully that gets sorted out a little bit later. Again, German losses are really starting to pile up, and there's this great scene where they're literally having to crowbar what's left of this poor guy out of his uh, HG-111 cockpit. They basically have to take him out of that cockpit a piece at a time. As the camera zooms in a little bit, you see all kinds of blood and gore, like splash on the inside of that canopy. This guy's a real mess. And like one of his comrades is watching. Again, they do show the German side of the battle. Speaking of the German side of the battle, here's where our favorite fat man, Mr. Goering, shows up. And he's now berating his pilots. And there's all this debate about, you know, who is, you know, screwing up, who's responsible for all these losses. The bomber pilots are blaming the fighter pilots for not providing enough protection, and so on and so forth. One thing that definitely does happen, that this movie does get right, is there is a line where, you know, Goering was asking, like, look, we're getting our asses kicked. I'll provide you anything you need to turn this around. You tell me what you need. And one German fighter pilot kind of spoke up. He's like, I can tell you what we need. He's like, you name it, I'll give it to you. What do you need? He says, Herr Reichsmarschall, give me a squadron of Spitfires. That's in the movie, and that supposedly really happened. So as the movie goes into its third act, there's a fair amount of character, drama, and development. Uh, but before you know it, the movie has come to September 15th, 1940. This is widely considered to be the climax of the Battle of Britain. And the movie shows us that with this shot here. Again, we are in RAF Fighter Command's control room. At upper left, we see uh, Winston Churchill and some of his advisors. And the gentleman at upper right, at the top of the three levels there, he's just hanging up the phone. He's just received a report detailing the status right now of RAF Fighter Command. So his boss, 11 Group Commander Park, comes out of the office with the Prime Minister there. And he says, is that it? He said, that's the lot. That's everything in. Every single British squadron is already engaged with the German Luftwaffe in the skies over Great Britain at that moment. And he asks reserves, and the officer replies, none. There's nothing left. 
Every single fighter we have is in the air and in a dogfight with a German as we speak. And uh, yeah, Park says, good, that's what I just told the Prime Minister. And this is where the movie really kind of goes all out in what I think is one of the best dogfight scenes uh, I've ever seen put to film. This is way before CGI, obviously. He actually had to put all these planes in the air. They wash out all the sound. It's just a really kick-ass score and occasional snips of frantic dialogue over the radio. Yeah, it shows a lot going on. And yeah, I'm not going to spoil it, but a lot of people don't make it through this. It's a, uh, it is a desperate, desperate dogfight spanning the whole swath of southern England, and yeah, it really does get pretty desperate here. Here's an interesting shot where we see uh, one of the weaknesses of the BF-109. The oil pump was apparently located right above the engine, and as soon as the engine took any kind of damage, the oil pump would blow up and blind the pilot. And also, now without an oil pump, the engine is overheating rapidly to the point of explosion, so not the best design feature here. One last shot at a British airfield, and I guess I just like looking at chalkboards, what can I say? But this really highlights the minute historical detail that these guys got right when making this movie. And this might come up in your war games, too. British fighters are still using that three-plane formation for their fighters. Two planes can hang together in a dogfight well enough, but as soon as things get hot and you know we get into a bit of a hairball there, that third plane, somebody in that three-plane group is going to get left on his own. And the second that happens, that second German pair in that swarm I was talking about is going to pounce on him, and he's done. Also notice how many names on this chalkboard are scratched out. And I won't spoil anything, but there are some major characters here as well. Uh, not everybody makes it through this movie. Fighter and pilot losses were very, very heavy on both sides, the British definitely included. And when Winston Churchill is talking about the few after the battle, he's not kidding. Uh, not by a long shot. And this continues until this happens. Pretty much nothing. One morning, the Germans just don't show up. We got a big plot chart here, surrounded by a bunch of bored ladies, nothing on it. Yeah, the Germans kind of, you know, realized they weren't going to make it, and they gave up rather suddenly. Uh, the movie gives us a uh, look at German infantry turning in their life vests and marching away from the coast of France. They're on the way to Russia, boys. Don't worry about it. It's a long march, but you'll be just fine. Nothing bad's going to happen to you in Russia, I promise. And that's pretty much the movie. As the credits start to roll, it does this great thing where it shows you all the other nations that had pilots in the Battle of Britain. And so it wasn't just British, although obviously the vast majority of them were British. Lots of other countries had pilots in this, in this battle as well. So it just goes to show that, you know, when you're playing in the Battle of Britain, you've got lots of options. And that's going to wrap up our review for the Battle of Britain. I honestly give this movie a solid 8 out of 10 on a historical chart. The only things that kind of gets wrong are sins of omission. The movie can't show you everything, it would be 10 hours long, but um, it leaves out a lot of the German bombers that we really should see, you could have in your games, and it leaves off that whole first third of the Battle of Britain, the, the Canal Comp I was talking about earlier. After that, you come down to tiny little nitpicky details like the sound of German autocannon versus British machine guns and little, little tiny stuff like that. But honestly, this is a pretty solid one, seriously guys. So for now, that's going to wrap us up. If you like this kind of uh, content, please make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Let us know what you think. Maybe we'll do some more of these in the future. But for now, this is Ariskany Jim signing off. And as always, Tango Mike for listening.